Good afternoon, this is Ken Weeks, WR Assistance from WormholeRiders.com, and we're the, here this afternoon with Kenneth C. Johnson, um, Kenny Johnson, I've been told to call him. Kenny, my father's name was Kenneth, and so I was always Kenny to my family, and that sort of stuck, and all of my friends and uh, uh, crew people have always called me Kenny, at least to my face, behind my back. Well, you know, I, I can appreciate that. I was exactly the opposite. I was born Kenneth. But everybody called me Kinney when I was growing up, and I changed my name when I was younger to Ken with two N's. Uh, Ken, I'd like to thank you for the Wormhole Writers uh, News Agency for spending some time with us today. Uh, we have a lot of fans of V, both of the old series, the original miniseries, V the Final Battle, the television series uh, in the 80s, I myself being one of them, and of course, your role as creator, as listed in the credits, of the new V series uh, by Warner Brothers. Um, we just want to know, uh, one of the fan questions that we have, we'll start with the fan question, then sure. talk a little bit about the old V, the new V, and something new coming in the future. Uh, most of our viewers, readers, uh, believe that you're actually an alien visitor yourself, and that you're down here on the planet uh, doing the research to see if uh, we're suitable for colonization. My wife and children sometimes feel like I, I'm a, somebody from another planet as well. They tell me that uh, a good deal. But no, uh, why would I lie to you about something like that? Maybe because you know Anna or Diana? No, I don't think so. <laughs> On the new series, uh, I do get it created by credit because I created the original uh, miniseries, of course, back in 1982, aired in 83. Uh, although I have absolutely nothing to do with the new series uh, at all, um, but because I created it, I get it created by credit, and, um, and I'm happy to take that. Well, we're all very thankful that you were here uh, nearly 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Going back in time, when you produced the original V, and then V, the final battle, uh, which were epic, um, groundbreaking special effects, uh, I remember tuning in myself and... Uh, buying the beta copy uh, of that, uh, and then, of course, the remastered DVD. What was your um, inception of V? Did this come from an earlier stage, uh, science fiction reading? Um, well, when I was a kid, I read a lot of things, including science fiction. I was not particularly a sci-fi guy, and I was trained in college at Carnegie Mellon University in the classic theater. Um, when I came out to California and my friend Steve Bochco introduced me to Harv Bennett, who was doing a show called The Six Million Dollar Man, and they were sort of in need of scripts in a hurry, and I suggested we make a mate for their Six Million Dollar Man, and I created The Bionic Woman, uh, which became suddenly a series of its own and very successful, thank goodness. Uh, and then, because of that, I was asked to do The Incredible Hulk, which I really didn't want to do, but uh, ultimately decided that I could finally make it work within a sort of classic context, uh, borrowing a little bit from uh, Victor Hugo's Jean Valjean and The Fugitive and that, and a little bit from Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, that I could make a real psychological drama that would play for adults. But, uh, but I never thought of myself as the sci-fi guy, although more and more because when you're successful at something, that's what people think you do. Uh, and it happened that way. But with V, V started because I had read a novel by Sinclair Lewis that was written in the 30s oh. called It Can't Happen Here, which was about a fascist takeover of the United States as was happening at the time in Germany and Italy with the idea, well, it can't happen here in America. And of course it does, and, uh, and I was intrigued by the notion of writing a, a contemporary story um, that showed a sea change in our life, where suddenly we woke up one day and the world was a different world. Um, and literally we were living in a, in, a, in a tyrannical society and ordinary people were being treated as though they were under occupation. And I wrote a, a spec screenplay, it means a, a screenplay that I wasn't paid for, about that sort of grassroots fascist takeover of the United States. Uh, there were no aliens, there were no spaceships or anything like that. Um, and my friend Brandon Tartikoff, who was running NBC, uh, sure. asked me if he could read it. And I said, no, no, Brandon, this is not television. This is a feature. It's a big movie, you know. Uh, but Brandon read it and went crazy for it and said, look, let's do this as a miniseries. It could become an ongoing series about America under occupation. That's a cool idea. And uh, so I, uh, uh, 
but he wasn't, Brandon wasn't sure that Americans would really get fascism and understand that concept, and uh, he, he wanted to have an outside force of some sort, like the then Soviets in the, uh, in the 80s, we were still in the Cold War, or the Chinese or somebody like that, and I didn't believe that either of those two nations could sustain a protracted occupation of the United States. And somehow the idea of aliens came up, and I went, oh, no, no, let's, I don't want to do that. Not you know, the alien story. I want to keep it real, you know. <laughs> but I went home, and I was thinking about it, and I realized that I could still tell the story that I wanted to tell, which was not about, and not ever about, big spaceships and a reptilian race and all of that, but it was about power. It was about a power that was in power, that had an extraordinary amount of power, and that uh, other people would suck up to, like the Vichy French sucked up to the Nazis during World War II, yes. because people who were powerful naturally attract people who want to be close to that power. And also it was about the people who said, well, if I just keep my head down, their power won't bother me and it'll be okay. And then it was ultimately about the people who said, wait a minute, that power is being abused and we need to fight back against it. And those are the people that came to, became the heroes of the resistance. And that was the story that, you know, that I wanted to tell. And I realized that by adding the science fiction aspect to it, the big spaceships and, the, and another race, that I could attract a larger audience than I might have otherwise. But I could still tell the same story that I wanted to tell. The essence of the story is not about spaceships and reptilians and all of that sort of thing. It's about power. And that's what makes V, I think, so unique in the annals of science fiction and why it was so phenomenally well received at the time. Uh, it, was, um, uh, it, was a, it was very, very rewarding to see people come to the show and tune in the way they did. Well, by, by 19, the 1980s, um, myself, I was born in 56. Most of us had forgotten, or if not a student of history, the fascism which occurred uh, and rose in the 20s and the 30s after the First World War, um, but the way that the V story melded the concept of fascism and you blended in um, some of the older characters from the older generation, you know, the, the grandfather right. that, that said... You know, with the survivor. V, the survivor, exactly, of the Holocaust, um, I think brought the idea of fascism back to uh, the forefront of people's minds. And I think that's why it was so popular, wouldn't you? Well, I think that V is, v is ultimately a timeless story. Certainly there's a lot of resonance, and I wrote it in specifically, a lot of resonance of uh, what happened during World War II, of the Holocaust, of the, uh, uh, of the subjugation of people by a supposedly superior race that was very, very powerful. Uh, and that's a story that has happened over and over again throughout human history. I mean, the United States of America was a British colony. Indeed. And, uh, and we had a tyrannical overlord. Uh, in, uh, in South Africa, it wasn't until very recently that the British pulled out of there uh, because there were the same kinds of stories going on during apartheid that were going on during World War II, that were going on during the American Revolution, all the way really back to Spartacus and the revolt of the slaves. Exactly. What makes V work so well uh, can, all the time is that it is a timeless story. If you look at my original movie that was made in 1983, uh, there's nothing that dates it to that particular period in time. Uh, the, virtually the same story can play nowadays or could have played 20 years earlier uh, because it was, it was a story about ordinary people suddenly faced with extraordinary circumstances and challenges and how some of them sucked up and bought into it and others kept their heads down and others said, no, we have to fight back. It's a classic story of the human spirit fighting back against an oppressive regime. Uh, and that's what I had sought to do, and fortunately I think that's what gives it the, the depth and the substance that sets it apart from so much science fiction. It's not just about blowing things up and spaceships flying around, it's about real people and real human emotions. Well, the story is indeed timeless. Um, many of our uh, visitors to, to coin a phrase, um, we, we do a number of science fiction series, which is where we started. Um, look at V as an iconic moment in their lifetime. Um, now, these people are not exactly of your generation or mine, um, but they, they see the connection to the story. 
And without your original work, there wouldn't be a new V-series today with uh, the likes of Marina Bakarin or Scott Wolf, um, writers and producers like uh, Greg Hurwitz, uh, mm -hmm. who is now on the, the new team over there at Warner Brothers. But I understand that in addition to that work, which is going on now, that you're contemplating working with a company called Centerboro Productions out of uh, New York and New Jersey for something called a V movie. Uh, are you at liberty to share any details at this point about? Sure. Well, the some v of this has already been had been posted on my website, which is just kennethjohnson.us. Um, but uh, an interesting thing happened a couple of years ago uh, in that I discovered that I own the motion picture rights to V. Warner's TV owns the television rights because I was under contract with them when I wrote it, so they can do whatever they want in television with or without me. Uh, but in motion pictures, nobody can do anything without me. Uh, and when word got out about that, I suddenly had a lot of new best friends. All, all of the major studios, literally all of the major studios, uh, invited me in, and um, uh, Warner's included, uh, as well as Fox and Paramount and MGM and United Artists and uh, uh, Dream World and Dream, Dream, Dream DreamWorks. Works, DreamWorks, yes. Uh, new Line and uh, Summon Entertainment. Them, they're yes, they're pretty hot, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and what they all wanted to do was to buy the rights from me, to have me produce, of course, uh, perhaps let me write, but they weren't sure that I could really do what they wanted. And uh, the bottom line, though, was that they wanted to bring in another director uh, to be the filmmaker on the piece, and uh, because they saw it as a big $200 million tentpole epic kind of picture, and I said, gee, no thanks. Seasonal blockbuster type yes, exactly. uh, production, yes. Uh, and I said, and I said, no, thank you. Uh, and they, when you say no in this town, that people think it's because you want more money. <laughs> and I, and they kept offering very handsome uh, um, offers. But I said, no, no, no. This, that, that's not the reason. Uh, the problem is that V to me is one of the most important pieces of work that I've ever created. And I have seen other pieces of my work be really totally bungled and destroyed by other people. Uh, the recent Bionic Woman series was a disaster that was gone in nine weeks. Uh, both of the Incredible Hulk movies, although they opened very big, were gone in the second week uh, because the audience was disappointed. The audience remembers something so iconic as the Incredible Hulk, as the Bionic Woman, and they have very fond memories of it. Not that you could recreate today what we did exactly back then, but the essence of the heart and the humanity and the emotional life that was carried forth in the Incredible Hulk and in the Bionic Woman was totally missed in, in these new manifestations of it. And, uh, and because of that, I said, no, 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 I'm uh, not going to let anybody else make a movie of this. Um, so what we're now in the process of doing is putting together an independent production uh, of, for V, the movie, that um, uh, will be a retelling of my original four-hour miniseries. Um, I'm a big believer in not trying to fix things that aren't broken. So it's not a reimagining that word reimagining is usually right up there with uh, the word disaster uh, in my estimation. Um, but um, Sometimes referred to as a reboot. Uh, yeah, well, there's in that the too. Lots of, lots of R words, most of which are, are dangerous to get involved with. But what we are endeavoring to do is to uh, put together a picture with a budget of about it's just under $50 million, about $49.5 million, um, which will allow me to maintain the creative control on the piece and to direct the piece, because what I am, first and foremost, is a director. That's, I took up writing and producing later in life. I was always a director first. 